it is your watch here is the time i know what they wanted me to do they wanted me to pray for them to be healed and for them to you know have all this deliverance and everything and so i came up and i said now uh, here we are today but i'm asking you a question i want you to ask uh, but but Timios, you got your sight and i'm asking after the opening of the eyes of the blind what next did he go out to get a job what did he make of his life? I'm looking at the paralyzed man and I'm asking him, after you've got your healing from being paralyzed, what next? I'm looking at the woman with the issue of blood, 12 years, and now you've got your healing, no more issue of blood. I'm asking the question, what next? Church, if we concentrate on healing, there are many people on the street over there that are not sick, and I don't see them doing anything significant in life. What I'm interested in is after the healing, what next? After the deliverance, what next? And after all the answered prayer for our physical needs being met, what next? I'm interested in what next? I see this man in Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. And then Peter said, silver and gold have I not what I have I give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Yes, I see the man jumping. I see the man leaping. But life is not jumping and leaping. And I'm asking the man, what next? Are you going to get it? job? Are you going to be able to live for yourself? Are you going to be able to do something and make life meaningful? After that, healing. That's why I'm, um, you know, going about and anywhere I go, I tell our people and I tell other people to care to listen that it's not only about healing, it's not only about deliverance, because after all that miracle, what next in our lives? It is that what next thing we have to concentrate on, and we're going to concentrate on that. And so that's why the Lord is saying, we therefore as workers together with God, we beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. And when we have got the grace of God at salvation, the Lord is saying, don't receive that grace of God in vain. Let something work out in your life. Let it affect your character. Let it affect your attitude. Let it affect your disposition. Let it affect your response to that grace of God so that we're not receiving the grace of God in vain. You know what some people did and what some people are still trying to do today with the grace of God? We're talking about the gateway through or the gateway of saving grace. We're looking at Jude verse 4. What he did with that grace. We're looking at Jude verse 4. In Jude, verse 4, here is what it says. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before dead of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. Turning, turning what? Into what? Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. You know, you meet a lot of people who don't say they are Christians, they are born again. They have the grace of God, and they can quote it for you. Or say, by grace, through faith, that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And then I say, but where is the evidence of that grace in your life? Oh, they say, don't look for evidence. I just know that I'm saved. And it is all by grace. And Christ did everything. And I say, you still nag and beat your wife at home. Oh, well, when she does something and, you know, if talk, talking cannot do it, then something else will have to do it. America does not mean that, uh, you know, we're still Africans. And the way Africans, uh, you know, bring uh, their wives under, you know, proper order is, if you don't have a kodje, you have a belt. And then, and I say, you are born in, of course, yes. What does beating my wife has to do with having the grace of God? It's all of grace. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And that's what the Lord is saying, don't do that. That if we're going to have 
the way that leads to life eternal. And we're going to have that that shows that we really have met the Lord. That grace will work out something in our lives. And this is the undefeatable life. And I pray it will come to every one of us in Jesus' name. And while I'm talking, don't just let me talk into the air. Let me talk to your heart. You need to be thinking about your own life and your own character, your own attitude and your own con comportment. You need to be seeing with my wife, how is it? And with my husband, how is it? With my children, how is it? And those of us who are leaders and, you know, preachers in the church, with the members of the church, how is, how is it? Uh, you know, uh, sometimes I, I used to think, and uh, this gave me problem when I was not a preacher, when I was just an ordinary member of the church. And in the church I went at that time, I, you know, I listened to the people. If we were saying something, discussing something, and then when they saw the pastor come, they'll say the pastor is coming. I said, what? When the pastor was not here, Jesus was here. What two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. And where, when the pastor was not coming, God was there all the time. And we were carrying on and talking what we were talking. Now that the pastor is coming, what's the big deal? Do we fear the pastor more than we fear God? And later I became a Christian worker. Later I became a pastor myself. And now I realize, as I have many pastors under my supervision and leadership, and I talk to some of the members of the church whenever I have time, I see that some members of the church fear the pastor more than they fear God, more than they fear Christ. And they tremble in their shoes, in their boots. And they say, if the pastor knows that, I say, are you worshiping the pastor? And sometimes a, a member of the church will have difficulty with a particular pastor in a location. Take New York here, for example. We have different, different branches. And then I meet somebody and I say, do you, have you see you in church? Oh, pastor, I'm not uh, going to that branch. Uh, I'm not going to the church anymore. I say, what? What's happening to you? And they say, something happened between me and the pastor. And I cannot go to that church anymore. I said, we have many branches. If that branch is not helping you, you want to go to hell because you're afraid of pastor so-and-so, go to another branch. If the pastor hears that I leave our branch and go to another deeper life branch, my trouble will multiply. And I think, what kind of fear is this? That the person knows the right thing to do to get to heaven. He knows the right thing to do to say, if that place is not profiting me or benefiting me, and I'm having something, I'm grinding with the local pastor there, I want to get to heaven. And since there are so many branches, let me go to the other one. But he's so afraid that so and so will not hear. And I'm asking you a question. If Jesus heard that this location is not all right for you, and you went to another location to hear the word of God, will Jesus punish you for that? No. But you're afraid of the pastor more than you're afraid of God. And I asked the other pastors too. I said, why don't you help me follow up this person? Ah, I cannot do that. If, uh, you know, the pa his son pastor heard that I follow up on him and I brought him to my church, I'll be in trouble. I said, what kind of church is this? That we're not thinking about the souls of the people. And the people, they themselves are not thinking about their souls and they're not at liberty. To be able to go to a church that will benefit them. In fact, I'll tell you, maybe you have not had me say something like this before. If the deeper life in town is not able to feed you, and then you know that, you know, you just want to, you say, I can't go to church. I'm just going to stay by myself. Don't do that. There's another church that may not be deeper life. And if they're preaching the word of God, go there. We we'll want you to get to heaven by all costs. And it is not that, you know, I must stay there in deeper life. Even if they're killing me and destroying me, I must stay there. The Lord Jesus said no. He died for everyone. He doesn't want you getting lost because you have a difficult situation in a local church. Find a place you can worship God and get to heaven. Is that all right? You know, but, you know, if you have all this fear and timidity and you cannot, you know, stand and it appears that, you know, deeper life, deeper life, I'm deeper life myself and, of course, deeper life number one. Praise the Lord. But, you know, as I try to be my best as a pastor, 
but my best has not always, you know, gone down with everybody as, you know, the very best. I told you yesterday of one of our pastors that I transferred. And then he went to, you know, he left the church deeper life and went to start his own. What if he just said, well, I disagree with Pastor Kumoyi. Because I disagree with Pastor Kumoyi, I will not go to deeper life, but I'll not start anything, I'll not do anything. I'll just remain there and die and go to hell because of disagreement with Pastor Kumoyi. How wise will that be? Take care of your soul. And he went now to another place. In that other place, he still continued with the gospel. I saw him recently. And anytime I, I, I phone him, I say, son, I seek, how are you? And then he says, I'm doing fine, daddy. And you know, he brought his wife to me and brought all the children to me and said, look at this and look at this and look at He even began to tell me some things that, you know, he said, this went wrong in the church. This went wrong in the church. Uh, daddy, what shall I do? Not in deeper life anymore. He's in his own church and he's asking me for counseling. What will I do? I said, no, you know, now you are an overseer. He said, daddy, don't talk like that. Whatever you tell me to do, that's what I will do. Uh, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that better than just, you know, staying at home and not going to any other church because he has disagreement with Pastor Kumoyi. I pray the Lord will set you free. That you will come to this church not worshiping a man. You'll come to deeper life, and it's not that you become so afraid that the grace of God cannot work out something in our lives. And you think about it as I talk, you know, the pastors are here, they're looking at me eyeball to eyeball, and then as I, you know, look at them, if I were to be afraid, Pastor Ni is here taking me up and down, if I were to, let's say somebody has a problem in his church and confronts me and says, this is what is going on, and then when I'm preaching, I become so afraid of my own son so afraid of a pastor under me that I cannot say what I need to say. That will be bondage of the highest order. When the GS and the pastor has to be afraid of the people he's guiding and leading. That's bondage. And I want every bondage in this church to be broken. That people come to church with a free mind, with the grace of God. And they just know that I'm coming to church to serve the Lord and have the freedom of mind. I have my heart there. And I have, I just love that church. You know, the places I go, you'll be surprised. That's why sometimes now they have all the security around me when I go to Nigeria. And I move here and there because, you know, some of them, it's not because they want healing or prayer or anything. They just want to, just to talk to me. And this time that, you know, that mom me went home to glory how the people come and you know sometimes uh, like like sunday i was in church and after we finished service and you know, somebody came in and uh, just said uh, you know how are you doing pastor i said i'm doing great he said uh, do you feed regularly do you do this who does this for you what can we do for you you know and that's the kind of church we to have it's not a church where we're all tensed up and we're all afraid and you're afraid to put your leg there and put your mouth there it's a family I said, this is a family. And we're going to remain with that attitude. That's the grace of God working in our lives. And, you know, as I came over here to the uh, United States, and somebody called from another country and said, uh, you know, I had your passing through our country when, when you leave the United States. I said, yes, thank you very much. He said, what can I buy for you when you, when you come? Just a member of the church. And, you know, that kind, that's just a good relationship. And it's not just, you know, the pastor is coming and everybody was ducking somewhere and hiding somewhere. He must not see me. What are you doing when she don't see you? What's the secret thing? What's the lie? And then sometimes you go to a place and I'm counseling somebody. Somebody just stopped me by the staircase and I'm talking to that person. And then they, you know, I'm very, I'm very observant. I'm not a psychology man, but I, you know, did a little of psychology in education. You know, you are talking to somebody and all of a sudden the person becomes almost absent-minded. And the person is fidgeting and jittering. And then he's looking in a particular direction. And uh, I say, you know, I'm talking to you. Why don't you look at me? He said, uh, our pastor is passing. And when I finish with you, the pastor is going, to, is going to ask me what I was discussing. I said, you're not free? I'm your father in the Lord. I'm the GS. I'm the one that makes deeper life branch here, anywhere possible. And here you are, you are talking to me. And you're so much afraid that your pastor will see that you are talking to me. And then he'll question you later. 
I should have the liberty to talk to anybody I want to talk to. And nobody gets in afraid that, you know, if my pastor sees me, if this one sees me, if that one sees me, that's bondage. That's what the Lord came to deliver us from. And that's why he said the undefeatable life. You know, if you are just living your life because of so and so, because of you never live the undefeatable life. It's the life that is free, that you know that this is the way to go. And whether I'm there or not, pastor is there or not, or whoever is there or not, you are going to live that life and you will live that life. And uh, you know, it is, uh, you know, you don't get offended when you hear the truth. You know, somebody sometimes, uh, when you tell them the truth, they get offended and, you know, they frown, they're unhappy. I say, my brother, what's your problem? You said this on your preaching. I said, but is it true? Yes, it is true. But, you know, how is that? Truth is getting you offended. If you're a child of God and you're following the way, the truth, and the life, how does truth get somebody offended? I'm talking about grace. The grace that comes into our lives and just sets us free. And I pray you'll be free in Jesus' name. Not free to sin, but free to live in righteousness. And you're free to live in that righteousness, whether somebody is watching, looking over your shoulder or not. I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at this, uh, Jude. It says, they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And it says, denying the only Lord God. God and our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. What else do they do? Uh, let us look at um, at First Timothy. We're looking at First Timothy. Yes, yeah, talking about the grace of God and what this grace of God ought to do in our lives. In the grace of God, the grace of God is Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter two. I'm reading from verse one. Second Timothy chapter two, verse one. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. As this grace comes into our lives, we don't just remain static and remain just at the same level. We become strong in that grace of God. In verse 2, it says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same Commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Trials come, temptations come, difficulties come, challenges come. And it says because that grace of God is in us and we're strong in that grace, it says we must be able to endure the trial, the temptation, the persecution, and the challenges that come our way. In verse 4, no man that worries and tangles himself for the affairs of his life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for the masteries, yet you see not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husband man that laboreth must be forced partaker of the fruits. Look at verse 7 now. Consider what I say. All these things we are saying. Consider them. Walk on them. And turn around. And let there be a change. Let the word of God that comes from the throne of God and comes into our hearts, let it make a turning around in our lives. Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. The Lord give you understanding in all things. We're looking at number two now. The good way sustain the good way of sustained godliness.